Hey everyone, and welcome to Game Assist. My name is Errol, my pronouns are he, him. Let's get right into it, shall we? A few months ago, I challenged myself to tackle a game that would require me to really dig deep to pull it apart. Something that wasn't as direct with political or social messages. Something that would allow me to put my literature degree and politics degree to the test. I was unsure of what to pick. Many games that I'm interested in are just too easy to pick apart. And then, looking through my games list on the Xbox One, the idea struck me. Or, more accurately, cut me in half with a chainsaw. Yes, in this video, I'm going to be talking about Gears of War. I decided to take a deep dive into a few topics that are pervasive throughout the series, examining this game from a political perspective. To this end, I decided to consume all of the media around Gears of War. Every single numbered Gears game, Gears of War Judgment and Gears Tactics, and every single comic and book that I could find. I have trolled the Gears Wikipedia pages, scanned Reddit threads, and attempted to condense it all into the 9,770 words that this script is made up of. To that end, I'm here today to talk about how Gears of War's coalition of ordered governments, better known as the COG, takes clear notes from both historical and modern fascism, as well as having 20th and 21st century USA written into its foundations. I'm here to talk about how this game shapes hypermasculinity and fascism into the roots of the faction it labels as its protagonists, their relationship with those coded as indigenous, and the role that stereotypical gender norms play throughout the tale. In this video, I'm taking a game that primarily revolves around turning your enemies into chunky salsa and unpacking its roots. Grab yourself a drink and a snack, make yourselves comfortable, and brace yourselves for a very uncomfortable deep dive into the politics of Gears of War. Before we get into this video, there's a few things you're going to need to know. Firstly, and quite obviously, this is going to contain spoilers for the whole Gears of War series, including the games, comics, books, and other media. Consider yourself warned. Secondly, and more seriously, I need to provide a lot of trigger warnings. Please do keep all of these in mind, and be aware that I have placed timestamps in the description which also inform you of when certain topics are being discussed in more detail. This video essay contains depictions and discussions of the following. General violence and gore, police violence, military violence, violence against women and indigenous communities, rape and statutory rape, fascism, and genocide. To talk about these things, I have read a whole load of material. This includes the work of political theorists, news sites, the occasional blog post, and literal actual fascists, who, I don't know if you know, are bad people. I've read their drivel, so you don't have to. I will be putting links in the description to everything I've read, but I will not be providing links to any of the fascist material I have read unless it provides a critique. Simply put, they don't deserve a platform on this channel, and I am discussing fascism enough as it is here. With that all out of the way, let's begin. To start with, let's provide you all with a quick Gears of War history lesson. Many, many years before the COG government was formed upon the planet Serra, a philosopher, Alexei Dezepik, with a name that's predictably plucked right out of the Eastern Bloc, and who is depicted as a fanatical socialist, created the idea of a world government coalition based on the eight principles of order, diligence, purity, humility, honour, faith, labour, and loyalty. This was then modernised and adapted by a Mr. Nassar Embry. Remember this name, he's going to come up later. Into what is known as the Octus Canon, the founding document of the first coalition of ordered governments. What we're going to call the Old Cog. His aim was to unite the world through order. Convenient timing too, as the states that made up the Old Cog had just found rich supplies of a miracle oil-like fuel, emulsion, right underneath their feet. This document, the Octus Canon, opens as follows. I am responsible for myself and my actions. I shall conduct myself honourably and live a clean and frugal life. I have responsibilities to my fellow citizens. I shall be loyal to them and humble because we are elements of a greater whole, and without them I am nothing. I have responsibilities to our society. I shall understand and respect my place in it, defend it, and work to make it prosperous so that I may receive society's protection and that we may hand on safety and prosperity to future generations. As this political and economic superpower rose, a Union of Independent Republics, or UIR, came together in response, and the old cog responded to that with significant military force, occupying nations and transforming them into vassal states. This was the beginning of the Pendulum Wars, a 79-year planetary war that began as a conflict over emulsion and transformed into a war of freedom and ideology. After this war, 
set before the events of the games, and the Locust War, another planetary war that is depicted in Gears 1, 2, 3, Judgment, and Tactics, the cog was utterly destroyed. But from the ashes of these conflicts, it reformed, with new leadership and purpose. It became what I'm going to term the new cog, which we get to see during the events of Gears of War 4 and 5. We also see the beginning of the Swarm War, essentially a continuation of the Locust War, just in a much fleshier shape. Okay, cog history lesson over. Now, before we really get into things, we need to address something. While to many of us, the COG is clearly a fascist regime, there are two major arguments against this, both of which end up reaching the idea the COG is socialist or communist. I'm going to start by confronting these arguments. The first major argument is one to do with politics rather than the game itself. The usual horseshoe theory argument, that they're actually left-wing, and that due to horseshoe theory, the far left and far right circle back, and are actually closer than you'd think. This is actually meant to be the USSR, everyone. These are the evil communists. Ooh. No. See, there's an issue with the existence of horseshoe theory that we need to confront before I even break down why it's politically bad, too. It's just so damn convenient. What a perfect tool to conflate acts committed by the state, such as police violence, discrimination against marginalised people, with theoretical acts committed by the left wing, you know, asking for basic human rights. It's the same nonsense as the existence of the alt-left, which isn't a thing or claiming that Antifa is a group to be vilified, when it isn't a group at all, it's a movement. Horseshoe theory exists to cloud who the real fascists are, allowing people across the political spectrum to ignore their complicity when people start getting shot in the streets. It's also just bait, let's be real. Something that everyone from centrists to the far right use to infuriate and throw off left-wing ideas, ending up defending and supporting fascism. I prefer to subscribe to the theory that, instead of the political spectrum being a horseshoe, fascism has arms that feed into all aspects of politics, twisting them to fit their own agenda. It's undoubtedly right-wing, but corrupts other ideas of conservative, centrist, liberal, and socialist politics. The second argument is one that relates to in-game content. Since Embry adapted the Octus Canon from Desipic's work, and since Desipic was a socialist bordering on fanatic, the basis of the COG is socialist, and since the developers and the COG say they're socialist, and they must be socialist, right? Wrong. These documents, both from Desipic and Embry, both describe a world government, not a movement, and therefore the society they depict is a nation led by a united body made up of different groups, a coalition of ordered governments, as it were. World government and socialism aren't exactly compatible. Socialism as a movement is a transitional period, the stepping stone towards communism, a decentralization of power, and a worker's struggle against exploitation by corporate and government bodies, and a step away from society's relationship with commodities. In short, socialism opposes capitalism and corporate control of production. That's clearly not what exists under the cog, with emulsion barons in the old cog hiking up fuel prices, and one of the few things saving them from riots being all out war. In a socialist system, you wouldn't end up with an economy tied to the value of a single product like emulsion as trade and capital would be regulated, and the eventual collapse of the markets prior to the Pendulum Wars is more symbolic of free market capitalism. You wouldn't end up with people like Aaron Griffin running the Griffin Corporation, an individual who ran his company through fear and exhibits his wealth while his workers suffer. The aggressive policing system in the new COG also goes against socialist beliefs, who see the police as an arm of the ruling class, which they are, as tools to protect the ruling class's interests, which they do, and act only to control the public rather than protect them which is true. This fits the role of the DB robots, and other individuals that we'll talk about later. Historically, it is worth noting that fascism is well known for appropriating and twisting social and political theory to favour its goals, very famously adopting Nietzsche in the 20th century, with much of his works edited by his sister to fit nationalist ideals. Of course, the fact that fascism adapted Nietzsche doesn't mean they adopted his core beliefs, just his words and rhetoric. It becomes quite clear that the COG have done something similar, adapted a political theory to their own ends. Twisting a purportedly socialist document to create a world government doesn't create a socialist government, it just creates a screwed up government. To me, it seems that this socialism is self-affirmed and lacks any actual proof of enough socialist policy or ideology to call it socialist. It's interesting that this was even attempted when you consider the Red Scare ideas that are carried over to this franchise. For anyone who isn't aware, the Red Scare is use of scare tactics to create a fear of left-wing ideology, namely, socialism and communism. This originated with McCarthyism in the USA during the Cold War, but still shapes the relationship between Western countries such as the USA and UK, and countries that are seen as the other, usually ones that the USA haven't attempted a military coup in for a few decades. 
So let's talk about the nation that are clearly meant to represent socialism. Not the COG, but the UIR faction. Now, let's make one thing clear. They are very obviously Russian. The Goraznian people, a nation that is part of the UIR and the nation we interact with the most, take influence from a number of Eastern European countries such as Bulgaria and Romania, and ex-UIR leader turned cog soldier, Garen Paddock, was designed to be an amoral character who speaks in a mixture of English and the Goraznian language, a tongue that sounds just foreign enough to be Russian. Did I also note that UIR weapons have names like Bushka and Marksa, again with notable Slavic undertones? So the cog are meant to be evil socialists, but so are the UIR? I think not. Okay, enough about socialism, I think I've done enough to explain why the cog is not, in fact, socialist. Now that we've done that, let's talk about what fascism is, other than an evil we should all be working to stamp out. Obviously your minds will race toward the 20th century, particularly the 1930s and 1940s, and mainly over to Europe, right? Your Adolfs, Benitos, that kind of stuff. That's a great starting point, but there's more to it than that. Fascism is an authoritarian style of government, made up of a variety of characteristics. A strong, continuing focus on nationalism, using patriotic symbols, flags, songs and slogans wherever they can, in order to reinforce the idea of being part of the state. Focusing on the idea of loyalty and action in order to convince the public their actions are worthwhile for the whole, when in reality they serve the state's interests. An unhealthy relationship with the military, providing a terrifying amount of funding to military research, glorifying the soldier and the active military service, while refusing to support them in their eventual return to communities outside of war. A similarly unhealthy relationship with national security, using fear to manipulate the public into supporting everything from equipping the police with military grade tools to building walls around your cities and countries. The protection of corporate power and interests, as oftentimes it's this power that allows a fascist government to rise in the first place and leads to deals and relationships that are beneficial for corporations and government. Often the state itself becomes corporate. The public, however, are left out of this, and are instead convinced that serving the state's interest, whether that is as a consumer, as a worker, or as part of the military or police, leads to a personal freedom. Simultaneously exploiting the working class while suppressing their power, using their disdain for the state to convince them of the progress of fascism, and using propaganda to claim that their voluntary work serves their country, convincing them to work themselves to the bone for a state that will not give back, while simultaneously disarming the working class recognising the power that organised labour has, and therefore shutting down, suppressing, or dismantling unions. Sexism, homophobia, racism, and ableism goes through the roof, using strict ideas around gender, particularly the role, safety, and place of women in society, to instil a bigoted mindset amongst the public, pass homophobic and transphobic policy, and place the woman in a strict role of baby machine and cleaner. Development of a patriotic unity through the formation of scapegoats and enemies, creating a patriotic fury through the picking of a common threat. People from different religious backgrounds, those of different races, and those who do not share the fascist political agenda. All of which serve to create an empire of their own making in order to preserve their own ideals. Using history and religion to manipulate public opinion or intertwining the church and state. Using the most common system of belief to manipulate public opinion and twisting religious rhetoric to favour the state, as well as reconstructing history to better serve their interests, particularly in regards to historical empires and depictions of rational thought. Both a disdain for outsider arts and thought and the co-opting of their platform, undermining academia, silencing the opinion of those within education or from historical or artistic backgrounds, and a lack of funding towards both education and the arts. While they inwardly oppose certain ideas of freedom of expression and the freedom of expression of certain groups, they are more than comfortable exploiting the liberal idea that all expression is good to debate and explore, that is, until they run the joint. Corruption and cronyism is everywhere, with regimes constructed of friends and associates who all serve to protect each other from accountability. A vice grip on mass media, either directly or indirectly controlling what the public see, hear and believe, using censorship, regulation and sympathetic spokespeople to make sure people see what the fascist government want them to see. An obsession with policing, crime and punishment, giving police almost limitless power to enforce laws, or whatever they want to enforce. The most privileged in society end up at a point where they overlook police abuse and sacrifice their own liberties and rights, and often the national police force has unlimited power over the country's civilian population. Complete disregard for human rights, claiming that human rights and civil liberties can be ignored for the sake of public security and persuading the public to overlook or even approve of it and elections that are fraudulent, if they happen at all. Everything from smear campaigns to voter suppression through legislation, gerrymandering, manipulating the media they control, internal elections, even shutting down political opponents outright is incredibly common. Oh wait, this all sounds like we will get back to that. Through this description of fascism, 
we can see many of the traits that the fictional Desipic describes are necessary in his world government. Order in respect for the state. Diligence in the persistence of the cog civilians. Humility and honour in their obsession with history and through the language used in nationalist propaganda. Labour in being a voluntary servant to the corporate state. And loyalty in rampant nationalism. Purity and faith can be seen through their attitude towards their military, and we'll get into that later. We can see several other elements of fascism through both old and new COG. The relationship between government and business, seen with the Emulsion Corporations and DB Industries. The cult of leadership, seen with Embry, Prescott and Jin. The repression of criticism through the violence towards stranded and civilian protesters. And the ignoring of the rights of the individual, best seen in their relationship with the outsiders. So now we're here. Let's talk about some more intricate details that really hammer home the fact that COG are, indeed, a fascist government. And you need look no further than their architecture to see the inspiration. Indeed, many of the buildings have ancient Greek and Imperial Roman inspiration underneath their Gothic designs, with influences from the Roman Pantheon and other temples, as well as statues echoing the same ancient Greek and Roman imagery. But why Rome, you might ask? Well, fascists romanticise Imperial Rome pretty consistently with the brutal history and dictatorships of the Roman Empire seen as a symbol of white supremacy. Of course, the Roman Empire was awful, but its symbolism was, again, a distortion, becoming a model for the Third Reich. Heck, even in the modern day, the salute is defended as Roman, and modern day far-right thinkers who envision a white United States see it as a revival of the Roman Empire. This only becomes more evident in Gears 3, with the opulent Azura facility, a place where the cog took its brightest, richest and most important civilians in order to protect them through the war so that after all was said and done, those with power and influence could rebuild their global empire once again. Naturally, this doesn't work out and they all die, but I can't say I'm too mad about that. To finalise my interpretation of the cog as fascist, we need to discuss the similarities in symbolism between Rome and the cog once again. The term fascism comes from the Latin fascis, describing a bundle of sticks. This represented a simple idea, one that fascism immediately latched onto. One stick, a single individual, is weak, useless, serves no purpose. When brought together with another material, such as the state that can tie them together, the sticks become strong. Through this lens, you can see the gear that represents the cog means the same thing. A singular gear is worth little, and serves no purpose, but together they are strong, creating a machine which can serve greater purposes. At this point, it is undeniable that the cog, the supposed socialist world government, are in reality a fascist totalitarian state, with the ideas of socialism practically burned to the ground. At this point, however, we need to bring in our second layer. The cog also served to represent the USA, both historically and in the modern day. Evidence of this can be seen throughout their history, and in particular with their human rights abuses. It's very clear that the cog will stop at nothing to ensure their continued survival at the detriment of others, even their own citizens. During the Pendulum Wars, they tortured captives, bombed civilians, crossed neutral borders to perform terrorist acts on perceived threats, and assassinated their political enemies abroad. This is par for the course with the USA, looking at their relationship with military coups from the Cold War onwards, and their treatment of the Middle East and Southeast Asia as fair game for drone strikes. The Karg are also responsible for using the Hammer of Dawn, a satellite-based superweapon, and the in-universe equivalent of the nuclear warheads developed and used by the USA, to vaporise most of the surface of the planet Serra, when they realised that they couldn't win the Locust War with the usual barrel of horrible military actions. The leader of the COG at the time, Chairman Prescott, gave the total population of the planet three days notice to evacuate to one city. Claiming to be so that the Locust couldn't respond, it was a coordinated move to eradicate those they saw as a threat. As you can imagine, a whole lot of people died, and those who didn't make it to safe zones became known as the Stranded, a population of homeless refugees across the planet who saw the COG as responsible for the destruction of their homes, saw the government as fascist, and the Gears as their lapdogs. The reason I bring this up is to talk about the COG's attitude toward the Stranded, which is similar to the US's attitude towards poor people or to refugees. They don't exist, and aren't worth their time. Within the book Gears of War, Jacinto's Remnant, we see fan-favourite character Dominic Santiago ruminate about the Stranded's relationship with his wife, Maria, who had lived with the Stranded, but had passed away in the events of Gears of War 2. One of the underclass he tolerated, didn't love, didn't respect, just tolerated, must have helped Maria. Maybe a whole group of them did. Now every stranded he met who wasn't an obvious bastard would look very different to him. Of course, it takes a personal interaction to suddenly believe that these people are actually human, and without that there'd be no qualms with shooting them on sight. Alongside that, the old cog uses manipulative tactics in order to entice vulnerable individuals into the military. In Gears of War 2, we see Dizzy Wallen, an ex-stranded gear who very clearly represents the American working class, what with his accent and design, who's assigned to driving and repairing vehicles, Throughout the game, the white working class is adored, the idea of struggling individuals serving the state through their work. 
Again, a core principle of fascism is this adoration of the working class white man. Dizzy informs the protagonist, Marcus Phoenix, that he was recruited under Operation Lifeboat, a propaganda campaign that would ensure safety, food and medical supplies for families should the men of those families join the war effort and the families become part of the COG. Without placing your life on the line, the government were not willing to provide that kind of safety. Considering the Stranded are a group of people the COG displaced themselves through turning most of the surface of the planet into ash, which, need I remind you, is for all intents and purposes morally unjustifiable and didn't even win the Locust War for humanity, they share clear links with refugees that the West create through proxy war and then ignore unless they're useful to them. Naturally, the Stranded who join the war effort are woefully unequipped, emotionally and physically, and their families don't see much of the support they were promised. Stranded are treated as second-class citizens that the COG create and then exploit, and then wonder why after the war so many Stranded abandon them and become the outsiders. The First Minister of the new COG, Mina Jin, stands as a representation of the admirable other, the good immigrant, the outsider who decides to assimilate. Beginning her life as part of the Stranded, she joins the COG at a young age, and as she reaches the premier position of First Minister, she enacts legislation that seemingly steps away from the goals of the new COG before her. Apart from hammering home her fertility program, which we will talk about later, she is the one responsible for arming her automated police force with lethal weapons. We'll be coming back to talk about you, Jin. Dizzy isn't the only vulnerable person the COG manipulates. The new COG did the same to young JD Phoenix. After his mother Anya's death, and his father Marcus's spiral into depression, JD finished school and almost immediately joined the COG, against his father's wishes, taking in a vulnerable, rebellious teenager and moulding him into an arm of the military that policed the state. Sounds pretty familiar to me. We can also talk about how the COG conditions its men within its military ranks. Throughout the course of the games, we can see several characters face incredibly traumatic experiences, namely Dominic Santiago, who is forced to kill his wife after her torture at the hands of the Locust, and Marcus Phoenix, who loses Dom after he sacrifices his own life to save his team, his father Adam, when he activates the Emulsion countermeasure weapon to destroy all Emulsion on the planet, then his wife, Anya Stroud, during pregnancy. To top it all off, he can potentially lose his son, JD, depending on the choices you make in Gears 5. It becomes clear that these men are not given the tools to process grief. In the case of Dom, in-game notes make it clear that he has suffered significant psychological trauma, and a medical professional notes that he should be looked after and supported. He attempts, rightly so, to step away from his military role, focusing more on growing crops. However, when they arrive at his wife's hometown, and are ambushed by both the Locust and Lambent forces, he rams a truck into a fuel depot, killing himself along with the rest of the enemy forces. He calls out to his wife, pulling at her heartstrings, but it has become clear that Dom has now accepted death as the norm, and has not been provided with the time and space to deal with his trauma. In a perfect world, he would have been given the chance to fully abandon military service, maybe even the COG altogether. That's precisely what Marcus does in Gears of War 4. Having lost his family figure in his father, and closest friends in Dominic and Anya, he abandons the COG, only to watch his son become more and more rebellious and join the COG himself. This, again, is because Marcus is not given the proper tools to recover. When you find him in the early hours of Gears 4, he has clearly picked up some of Dom's habits, namely, growing tomatoes and other plants. However, the home that he and his family were to live in lies in ruins, the project he had hoped to finish holding only relics from the past war. It's interesting to see that the few things he holds onto are his old gear armour and his custom weapons, enough weapons to arm a small army. He has become more reclusive and defensive over time and it shows. Simply put, men in the Gears military were not given the tools to deal with the atrocities they face or commit. Considering that the COG had almost 80 years of war prior to the events of the games, you'd think that they'd have invested something into the rehabilitation of their soldiers. Instead, the Gears hold up to their name, being simply part of a machine, and with how the COG repopulates itself, those parts can be readily replaced. Alongside this, men with any more emotional capacity than our protagonist Marcus tend to end up on the receiving end of a swift and painful death. We've already talked about Dom, a man who quite clearly cares for his family, but let's pick some other examples out. In Gears 2, we meet Tai Kaliso, a man quite clearly coded as indigenous and living up to all of the noble savage stereotypes, transformed from a twisted man with an emotional side to a shell of what he once was at the hands of the Locust. When he is rescued, Marcus, who as I've said, has not been given emotional tools, hands him a shotgun and proceeds to order the whole team to carry on with the mission. While he turns away, Kaliso turns the shotgun on himself. Hell! Even at the end of Gears of War 3, 
Adam Phoenix's last moments are ones of remorse, begging those that follow him to live free lives before he gets snapped out of existence. In Gears 5, you are forced to watch from the mind of a swarm creature as Kate's uncle, Oscar, is mercilessly slaughtered, watching the last member of her family, well, the last human member of her family, someone she clearly cared for and who reciprocated that care, get butchered helplessly, shows yet another situation where men with any complex emotions lose their chance at life. Alongside that, the player as Kate has to make the decision as to which of her two compatriots will die. JD, a man who is incredibly remorseful and regretful of his actions, which have been both heinous and heroic, which breaks the heart of his father Marcus. Or Del, one of the few black men in the franchise whose personality doesn't boil down to a generic stereotype, who discusses wanting to become a teacher after the Swarm War ends. At the end of the day, only two kinds of men exist in the Gears universe, those hardened by war, who show little emotion and obey the cog, individuals like Colonel Hoffman, Marcus Phoenix, and the likes of Baird and Cole, and those who defy these ideals, show emotion, which is seen as weakness, and are therefore not fit to continue surviving. Speaking of which, we need to talk about the fact that many of these men that we play as are complicit in the cog's vice grip on the planet. I've already talked about the DBs in the new cog, a type of humanoid robot designed by another series protagonist, Damon Baird. Originally designed as trash collectors, construction workers in hazardous areas, and for other high-risk work, they end up becoming guards before becoming a police force, eventually taking any and every role that could possibly be dangerous to humans. This, interestingly, seems to have been an attempt by First Minister Jin to preserve human life, but she is more than comfortable with her automated police force, armed with both non-lethal and lethal weapons, firing on civilians. We still don't know a lot about the massacre at Settlement 2, other than that several human cog soldiers, accompanied by DB automated police who are armed with lethal weapons, were responsible for shooting civilians who were protesting against the new cog. See, whilst building these new settlements, the cog had promised to allow these individual settlements to diverge, creating their own cultures and norms, and eventually become more independent from the cog. Naturally, the government reneged on their word. In this, we see a very familiar picture. Protesters arguing for their freedoms, things becoming violent due to police escalation and the arrival of lethal weaponry on the side of the state, and the protesters using more and more tools at their disposal to protect themselves and protest. Of course, since the state views all groups of resistance as threats, refusing to understand them and fiercely attacking all of those who question, this was never going to end well. As the violence progressed, JD Phoenix, the central protagonist and the character you play as in Gears of War 4, orders his DBs to open fire on the protesters. This wasn't isolated either, some of the human soldiers also ordered their DBs to do the same. All of this for compliance. It's becoming clearer and clearer that the cog has become a police state the further we dive into this. It's surprising that this is such a small footnote in the list of horrible things I'm discussing, but the franchise also trivialises genocide, making it an incredibly regular occurrence within the franchise. On three separate occasions in the Gears of War series do you enact genocidal hostility against the Locust, one in each of the first three games. In the first, a series of explosives are used to collapse a majority of their tunnels, and in the second, you flood their capital city resulting in the Locust becoming, essentially, stateless. In Gears of War 3, you use the Emulsion Countermeasure Weapon, which also destroyed all of those infected or exposed to Emulsion. Due to the Locust living underground and their exposure to Emulsion, they were almost wiped out of existence. And the game glorifies the wiping out of an entire species at that moment. Little were humanity to know they'd screwed up even further. And speaking of the Locust, it's time to talk about them. The Locust the humanoid species that are the primary antagonists of the Gears franchise didn't just appear from nowhere. I doubt that it would surprise you, after everything I've discussed, to tell you that their existence, their invasion, and their resurgence as the swarm is literally all the cog's fault. Get ready for another story. The origins of the locusts stem from genetic experiments conducted by the old cog to cure rust lung, an infection that cropped up in workers who were mining and processing emulsion. This began at the New Hope Research Facility, and started as all horrifying fascist scientific experiments do in fiction, by injecting children with emulsion and seeing what would happen. Naturally, the answer was they'd mutate and then die. Apart from one, a young girl called Mira, who had a genetic immunity to the effects of the emulsion. It actually served to make her stronger, improving her immune system and making her age slower. While trying to replicate her abilities, the scientists attempt to mutate yet more children, this time using the DNA of the creatures that lived underground alongside the emulsion, creating genetically unstable monstrosities that came to be known as sires. Naturally, the scientists at New Hope tried to cover up this element of the experimentation, but the information leaked to the old COG government, and the chairman at the time shut down the facility. Of course, this story doesn't end there. A group within the upper echelons of the COG, described as a fringe group, secreted the scientists responsible for these last experiments away. 
taking Mira with them. In spite of simply being a fringe group, these individuals clearly held a great amount of power, influence, and money, building the new Mount Kadar facility and providing the scientists with the materials and funding to continue these experiments. The end purpose is no longer simply to cure us long, no, this time it was the full fascist fantasy experience. They were going full Warhammer 40,000 and attempting to create genetically superior super soldiers to win the Pendulum Wars. I criticised the idea of this group simply being on the fringes, as they clearly had significant power and influence in the COG, enough to hide such a large experiment and fund its continued progress. While they may not have held executive power, they were clearly prominent enough. Eventually, these experiments bore fruit. After combining the DNA of the sires they had created previously with embryonic stem cells from Mira, they eventually created the Locust, a group of humanoids bred with survival in mind. Not only were they an almost perfect super soldier, able to take the same amount of damage that a fully armoured human could and survive to dish out even more, they were also designed to survive generational conflict, ensuring that they would always make it through another situation like the 79 year long Pendulum Wars and come out on top. This, of course, explains the Locust's survival at the end of Gears of War 3, evolving with the dead, crystallised emulsion to become the Scions, the leaders of the Swarm. As you'd expect, keeping a small army of super soldiers imprisoned was never going to last long, and for reasons that will become important later, the Locust broke free with Mira as their leader, destroyed the facility, slaughtered every human they encountered, and retreated underground, leading the faction that originally funded the experiments to cover the research up. It's not like anyone could have seen that coming, right? So now that we've talked about the Locust's origins, let's talk about them as a people. It's established quite early on that the Locust are a people with their own culture, their own religion, ideologies, and beliefs. These are so alien to humanity, however, that they are seen as insane, barbaric, and primitive. They worship the great rift worms that created the underground tunnels in which they make their home, and in particular, worshipping the last living rift worm, a creature that you kill in Gears of War 2. It's understandable that the Locust would be devastated, angry, and horrified, considering you've essentially killed a living god, and the creature that allowed them to survive. As they lacked the tools that humanity had, their scientific material was a mixture of technology that was stolen and repurposed from human civilizations, and organic technology, using the creatures that lived underground with them to their advantage. As they were created as soldiers, their methods of reproduction were limited and brutal. Either they could capture humans and mutate them with the same scientific procedures used on the first locust, or breed with one another. That is a dangerous procedure in itself, as the women within the locust, known by humans as berserkers, are ten foot tall, nigh indestructible, and incredibly violent. This meant that locust men would resort to restraining and raping these berserkers in order to produce offspring. More and more, these creatures made by the cog become horrifying parodies of militarized humanity. The locust, it turns out, weren't simply invading they were running. The emulsion, the miracle fuel that humanity had warred over for generations, was more dangerous than had been predicted. It did not just cause rust lung, it infected its host, turning them lambent, with an aim to simply consume all life, similar indeed to other viral forms of undead, such as Halo's Flood, for example. It turns out that one human, Adam Phoenix, knew about this all along, and Mira had attempted to convince Adam to create a cure. Instead, he worked on cog weapons of mass destruction, such as the Hammer of Dawn. Due to humanity's obsession with slaughter, the only choice Mira saw was invasion. She saw that the survival of the Locust was not compatible with the way of life that Cog had created. She herself stated that humans only understand dominance and ownership. All that we have left is a war to the death. We never stood a chance of enlisting their aid, so now we fight alone, and we will stand on their corpses to do so. The theme of adapting humanity to serve the military might of the Locust is seen again in the assimilation of humans into the ranks of the Swarm, 25 years after the Locust War is over. A very direct analogy, using the theme of metamorphosis, we see transformed, radicalised, mutated humans. Not only that, but the terms Horde and Swarm have become rather racially charged, used primarily in discussing refugees and mass media. When you examine them through a historical lens, things become a bit more clear. The Locust's creation during the Pendulum Wars can be an analogy for arming and equipping people of colour in countries near to or controlled by the USSR. Seeing their abandonment, and the fact they are ignored by the few in the cog who recognise them, as the West, abandoning these groups in a vacuum where they know nothing but conflict, only for them to come out as a religious group that seeks vengeance against those who abandoned them when they most needed support. It isn't a far-fetched idea that these antagonists take on the traits of insurgents armed in the days of the Cold War to combat Soviet influence. Many games at the time used radical Islam to develop its villains. Don't worry Halo, I'll be coming back for you and your prophets later. 
The Swarm then become the groups that have evolved from the violence that has been enacted in the wars after the Cold War. They are depicted as horrifying on a physical level, rather than a religious level like the Locust, or a technological one like the Cog, or UIR. With all this in mind, you realise that the genocides committed against the Locust were even worse than before, that humanity created its own doom on multiple occasions, and that Mira's rage at the end of Gears of War 3, her vitriol, does not come from a place of rage, but a place of betrayal. After all of these years, humanity, the species who created them, the only species with the capabilities to find a cure to the emulsion that would allow both humanity and the Locust to coexist, has failed, and instead they have doomed their species to extinction. No wonder they're so angry in the more recent games, and I can't say their anger is unjustified, even if their methods of literally converting humans into mutated creatures isn't great. Then again, they learned that trick from the best, didn't they? And considering that the COG decided to erase that part of history by dumping the locust bodies in old mining facilities and other deep pits from which they could just ignore and move on, the new COG seem intent on erasing and rewriting their old history rather than building from it. This is echoed in their move from towns with imperialist museums and tombs glorifying war criminals, I'm sorry, war heroes, to shining new settlements. It's also repeated in their Hamilton-esque musical rendition of Nassar Embry's story, I told you he'd come up again. Hamilton has been criticised on multiple occasions of glamorising slave owners in the American Revolutionary War. With such a tale as a reference point, it wouldn't surprise me if Embry did the same. If the cog are good at one thing, it's burying their past, only to reenact it and learn nothing from it. With all of this in mind, I want to finish up by talking about women and their role in Gears of War. Within the Cog, Locust and Swarm, we see women serve a limited number of roles, and we need to dig right into that to see how this universe views them. In the days of the old Cog, you see women very rarely, and in Gears 1 and 2, you meet a total of two. Yes, two. This number is expanded in the media outside of the games, and in Gears 3 onwards, but let's focus on these two first. Anya Stroud, a lieutenant in the Cog, is immediately set up as someone Marcus Phoenix knows, and a connection is built between them. It's clear the game aims to set up a relationship, either platonic or romantic, between them. She serves as the voice of the control group for your unit, relaying you commands and information, and reassuring characters like Dom and Baird throughout the games. In Gears of War 3, we see an updated version of Anya, a more militarised version, wearing cog armour and with a shorter haircut. She serves a similar role still, kind of running the joint, but is shown to be just as capable as her male counterparts for all of a few missions. On occasion, she takes up a role as part of the team, and after Dom is killed, Anya becomes the Player 2 character, setting up her role as incredibly important, seeing as she's now taken the place of Marcus's closest friend. At the end of the war, and the seeming destruction of the Locust and Lambent, it is Anya who comforts Marcus. And that's the last time you're going to see her, because between Gears 3 and 4, Anya gets unceremoniously fridged in order to further the relationship between Marcus, JD, and the new cock. Passing away while losing her second child, her death results in Marcus's distancing from the world, and JD's rebellion from his father. Anya is, however, responsible for the rebuilding of the cog. Yes, she starts the new cog. And while she didn't enact some of the more questionable policies, she most definitely set up the opportunities for them, considering that Mina Jin was her protégé. The relationship between the new cog and DB Industries, set up by her colleague and friend Damon Baird, is part of the cronyism that allows Jin to make use of the robots he makes as police, and eventually military. Now, looking at the other main woman in the original series, Queen Mira. Oh, Queen Mira. You've taken on a whole new shape since Gears 4 and 5 were released. Yet another strict leader, Mira seemingly knows the experiences of all the locust around her. It turns out she's actually a queen on more than one level. Not only does she represent a monarch, but it turns out the Locust is a hive mind, and Mira holds control over them. Her disdain for humanity stems from her experiences at the Mount Kadar facility. She fell for a scientist in the facility, Dr. Torres, and they end up having a child together, a young girl named Reyna. Eventually, Dr. Torres begins to have doubts about the research they're performing, and escapes with Reyna. The head of the facility, Dr. Samson, lies to Mira, informing her that Torres and Reyna died attempting to escape, thinking that knowing this would be better than the alternative. Instead, thinking that the two most important people in her life had been needlessly slaughtered by humanity, she assumed full control of the Locust and slaughtered her way out of the facility. So you see, not only is the creation of the Locust the fault of Cog science, it's also their disdain for women. Samson's perception that this lie would be effective, and also his assumption that Mira was passive, led to the site's downfall. At the end of the Locust War, Mira confronts Marcus and his team around the remains of his father, saying some very poignant things. Briss. 
Hold your fire. Ah, oh, so pious and immoral, even now. Is that what you think? Your father always thought he had all the answers. But he had none. Nothing but clever ways to kill. The Hammer of Dawn. Jacinta. And now, this. And his arrogance finally killed him. Of course, even though she's right, she can't be allowed to live, so dictates the plot. After her death at the hands of Marcus Phoenix, what follows is 25 years of peace for the new cog, or, you know, as close as peace you can get to while he continued to alienate the communities outside of your jurisdiction. The swarm you eventually encounter seem leaderless, and it's interesting to see that the swarm specifically need a woman to lead, particularly one of Mira's bloodline. The society is matriarchal to its core, and in Gears 5 you kill that matriarch, basically an oversized berserker, to sever Kate's connection with the swarm who had been working tirelessly to capture her and use her to replace Mira as Queen of the Hive. See, it turns out that if you hadn't worked it out already, Kate is Mira's granddaughter, and her mother Raina is the same Raina that escaped from the facility. However, it turns out that Queen Mira is not actually dead, because of course she isn't, and she ends up inhabiting the body of her daughter Raina to reclaim her place at the head of the Locust. Outside of these two, you have a handful of tertiary characters who are women. Sam, one of the few characters who is the voice of emotion other than Dom, who becomes Baird's lady friend after the war, and Bernie Mataki, who ends up in a relationship with the gruff Colonel Hoffman, and is shown to be just as brutal as other men in the game. Also, a whole part of her story in the books is about the fact she gets raped, that's just her entire character arc, which is, you know, not great writing. You also have Maria and Raina, both of whom are important characters for the sake of the plot. Maria Flores, clearly a character coded as Hispanic, is Dominic's wife, who had been stuck with the Stranded since the war began, and who Dom had spent many years trying to find. Reina Diaz is Kate's mother, coded as both Hispanic and Indigenous American, and begins the game as the leader of an outsider group, and is captured by the Swarm. Gears 4 revolves around your mission to find her. In both cases, you come to the same situation. Both of these women are found in a state where they're practically no longer human. Maria has been mercilessly tortured by the Locust, leaving her a shell of what she once was, echoing what we saw in Taikaliso earlier, but far worse. Marcus does a poor job of comforting Dom, leaving him to make a decision. Raina's fate is much the same. She's connected to the Hive in a very different way, and she informs her daughter that cutting her down will kill her. But that's what she wants. Kate is then forced to do precisely that, kill her own mother, in order to save her from her fate. Then there's Jin, the depiction of the racist good immigrant trope. The ex-stranded turned cog leader is just as cruel as those in the old cog, Having grown up in a world that has buried its history, Jin has somehow ended up repeating it, creating closed off cities around the wastelands that the Cog created, and oppressing those outside her cities. She also ends up favouring her capital, New Ephira, which leads to the Settlement 2 massacre. Some would point to a stranded background as the thing responsible for this, but this would not be the case, and arguably would be racist. Instead, Mina Jin fully embraces Cog philosophy, is devoted to their ideals, she viewed the Outsiders, part of her own community years ago, as a problem to be solved. It was under her rule that the new cog became the totalitarian state that was seen in the old cog. She essentially becomes an assimilated member of the state. But what if you're not a named character in the Gears universe? What if you're just a faceless Jane Doe trying to live your life under the cog? Well, I hope you like pregnancy. In the days of the Locust War, the old cog developed birthing creches, a fancy way of describing farms akin to prisons, within which they placed women and children, yes, children, so they could breed with superior gears, and theoretically give birth to genetically superior soldiers. They would treat young girls as prize-breeding animals, only to induce puberty at the age of 10. Most of the women and girls were impregnated artificially, often forcefully, but this was not always the case, and rape was incredibly common. Many of the women in the farms would be offered to some of the more decorated soldiers. Bear in mind that this was sanctioned and justified by the state, claiming that they wanted to both support the troops' morale and attempt to ensure that the superior genes of the COG soldiers would pass on to children. We know this is screwed up. The COG government sanctioned rape of women and girls, treated them like breeding stock, and attempted to justify it. The rhetoric of superior genes within soldiers is incredibly reminiscent of actions committed by the fascist German state, and many military bodies overlook these kinds of acts. But somehow, when you look into how it's viewed by characters, it gets worse. Within the book, Jacinto's Remnant, 
we see the thoughts of high-ranking male official Colonel Hoffman regarding new sign-ups to the war effort, particularly in regards to these birthing crashes. At least Prescott would be happy to see more women of childbearing age joining the Remnant, but Hoffman wasn't convinced they'd take kindly to the do-your-duty-and-get-knocked-up philosophy of the COG. Plenty of women were happy to keep popping out babies, even women he'd have thought would have objected to being treated like broodmares. On the other hand, lots of women objected to the baby farms. The stranded females were probably the independent kind, who'd tell Prescott where he could shove his repopulation program. And not enough adult males here. I need to replace the gears we lost. Stranded men were probably the wrong material anyway. Humankind had lost a generation of its best, and that was going to take a long time to put right. This idea of stranded men being the wrong material, and wanting to replace a generation of its best, that evidently being the gear military, screams of fascism yet again, and sounds more like the Lebensborn program run by the German state from 1935 to 1945. Another human selective breeding program, with a focus on women married to German SS forces, aiming to increase the number of racially pure children, those of the right material. Back onto the topic of women's roles, however, we shall now examine the evolution of women from baby makers in the old cog to baby makers in the new cog. In order to combat a population drop after the events of the Locust War, the new cog created the Ministry of Procreation, a department that aimed to bring humanity to its pre-war population, or as close as possible. In order to do this, it created maternity annexes in its new settlements, medical buildings solely dedicated to pregnancy, childbirth and postpartum. It developed propaganda that encouraged its citizens to have as many children as possible, and also researched ways to reduce infertility to allow women to continue having children. This propaganda looks like it's been ripped right out of early 20th century Germany, and it seems that the role of women as baby maker has not changed. Hell, at the start of Gears 5, the new COG's leader, Jin, proudly displays her pregnant belly to Marcus Phoenix, while attempting to convince him to move his wife's body to a more prominent place as propaganda to encourage further pregnancies. It seems that women in the Gears universe only fill certain roles. They become akin to the men around them, characters such as Mira and Jin come to mind. Alternatively, they are seen as distractions and are hurt or killed in order to further the plot and traumatise main characters. However, we've still got one character to wrap up with. Kate is something a little bit different. The daughter of Reyna, granddaughter of Queen Mira, encoded again as Hispanic and Indigenous. She is a prominent character in Gears 4, and while she isn't Player One's character, her story drives that campaign. In Gears 5, however, she is the main protagonist. And after the prologue, where you discover that J.D. Phoenix murdered civilians and watch him use the Hammer of Dawn for the first time in 25 years, accidentally killing some of his own, you play as Kate for the rest of the game. You literally cannot play the game unless one of the three players is Kate. So we've established her prominence in the series. While she is an outsider in Gears 4, she joins the COG in Gears 5, becoming another servant of the state in order to protect those she loves. After her Uncle Oscar's death, however, she pretty much defects, albeit temporarily. She recognises that this is about her, not the COG, and disobeys orders to explore her link with the Swarm. The last time we heard of people disobeying orders, we found Marcus Phoenix in a prison cell at the start of Gears 1. It is due to this direct disobedience of the state that Kate recognises the true threat and discovers that the COG are truly responsible for their own destruction. Kate somewhat breaks the narrative. She refuses to follow orders, takes her own path, and discovers things that, without her actions, would have led to the likely destruction of the COG. She does fit in with certain narrative themes, however. Like Marcus and his team, Kate sees the evils committed by the COG. She questions them personally, but never seems to relate that back to the state. These are always seen as past decisions and are never critiqued, usually because those who committed these atrocities are dead. However, their actions still have repercussions and should be answered for, by someone, at least. If you found out that a hundred years ago the ruling government created the species that almost led to the planet's extinction, you get a bit mad too, right? Even when Marcus abandons the COG after Anya's death, he rejoins when the swarm arrive. It's almost like Gears tells us to overlook the implications of these actions, to get in bed with those who are responsible, and to avoid questioning them when the time comes. Back to Kate, however. Due to the manipulation of Dr. Samson, the swarm will revive Queen Mira in Reyna's body before Kate can sever her connection to the swarm. Again, a woman becomes a tool for men to exploit scientifically. Again, this leads to mass destruction. The cycle repeats itself, and this act of male exploitation leads to the swarm's increased intelligence, the arrival of the Swarm Queen, and the death of one of your team. But you get to choose that. This is the first real branching option in the Gears franchise, several games in a decade down the line. Your choice, as a woman, is to enact violence against another woman in order to save one of two men. This doesn't surprise me. After all, these are all Gears, and under that state a woman's role is to protect and serve men. Her relationship with Del, JD, Marcus, and even her uncle Oscar reinforces that. 
I didn't expect Kate to break with tradition enough. After all, as part of the coalition of ordered governments, she takes on the role of one cog in the machine, one branch in the bundle. I'm going to leave you with that thought. And with that, that wraps up the video. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch this. If you've enjoyed it, please leave a like and be sure to comment. We love some constructive discussions about how fascism is the worst and must be dismantled, whether it's in real life or in the games we play. As always, a huge thank you to our patrons who make videos like this possible. We genuinely couldn't do this without you. Big shout out to Ditsy Doggy and Ryan Hendry, as well as Charlotte Turtle and Ajib Hassan. Thank you to all of our new patrons too. If you aren't a patron already, please consider supporting us over at patreon.com forward slash gameassistyt. Catch us over on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram for further discussions and conversations. And as always, thank you for watching and take care.